Well, hello there. So, it seems that hitting my computers at the start of every video uh, has become a, a trademark of mine. So, I just did it. There you go. Uh, so, today I thought I'd make a video about this thing, uh, which is considered uh, by many as one of the worst Macintosh models ever made. Uh, that is the Macintosh uh, Performa 6320. Well, uh, I should explain. Uh, Apple, in their infinite wisdom uh, back in the 90s, uh, decided to divide uh, their product lines into uh, consumer, professional, uh, then there was the Quadra, which I don't know, the Centris, which supposedly was in the center. Well, the thing is, the performers were the uh, consumer version of the Power Macintoshes, which were the uh, professional versions. Then there, w there were the LCs, which were mainly aimed at education. And again, the Centris and the Quadras, I have no clue where they fit into that. I think the Quadras are like the top end uh, of the spectrum and the Centris are supposed to be in between the Performas and the Power Macintoshes. I'm not sure. Thing is, uh, the Performas were exactly the same as the Power Macintoshes. So this machine is... Uh, actually a Power Macintosh 6300 with a different software bundle and well it, it does include um, a hardware MPEG uh, decoder card which is what gives it the CD uh, surname uh, it, it, otherwise it will be it would be simply a Performa 6300 or a 6310 or a 6320 uh, there's there was the 6320 alone, and that is the same exact same model without the uh, the MPEG decoder card. Now, why does an MPEG decoder card uh, give it the CD surname and not uh, the DVD surname? Well, DVD they didn't really exist back then. This machine was released in 1994. Uh, DVD didn't really exist back then, so the MPEG decoder card is for MPEG-1. So that is Motion JPEG. Um, so the CD surname comes from the fact that it can play video CDs. Sorry, no, CD video, which is different. Uh, video CD is actually more related to, uh, to Laserdisc, I think. Is it CD video that? Yeah, CD video is more. Uh, CD video is m like a small laser disc in the size of a CD, which can only fit like a music video, short stuff like that. Uh, video CDs are actually MPEG uh, decoder, decoded. Uh, sorry, encoded uh, discs. And yeah, multimedia, yay! Because the '90s, you know, it even has a headphone jack. Would you look at that? Ports in an Apple computer! Uh, and standard ones at that. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the only standard port in the entire machine. So, specifications. Uh, this thing has um, a PowerPC 603E CPU running at 120 MHz. Uh, it has 512 kilobytes of video memory and it has a proprietary Apple uh, digital analog converter uh, so no video acceleration pretty much, well a bit of 2D video acceleration um, it has a sound card capable up to 22.1 kilohertz sample rate 16-bit uh, sound, PCM sound and of course it does MIDI and all that stuff um, it has a what I believe it's an 8x or a 4x CD-ROM drive, that one is SCSI. It has a 1.44 megabyte uh, super drive, which is Apple speak for uh, a floppy drive, pretty much, that can read and write 
just about every format under the sun except for the 2.88 uh, megabyte IBM floppies. It has, um, let's get closer to this, it has an infrared window right here for a TV remote. That's something very cool about this machine. Uh, then it has volume buttons right there in the front. We have a power light, headphone jack, under there we have a speaker and then we have two tabs uh, under here and under focus and under there, under the PowerPC logo, um, which allow you to remove the front cover of the machine. Uh, now, uh, more specifications. It has a TV capture card and a TV tuner. That's why it has the infrared uh, remote window right there. Also, I believe it is not just a receiver. I believe it is. it can also beam stuff to, like, your PDA and all that, you know, your Apple Newton uh, message pad. Yeah, Apple was a mess in the 90s, wasn't it? So, yeah, let's turn the machine around and see if I forgot anything about it. Uh, which is hard because it has grippy fit, uh, uh, grippy uh, fit, and yeah, this just fell off. Uh, yeah, uh, this is the cover for the power supply, for the back of the power supply, and there we go, let's put this back on, this usually is held in by a couple of uh, plastic bags, come on focus you piece of crap, yeah and I thought this camera was going to be good for video, uh, there we go. So there, there used to be a plastic bag here and another one there. And yeah, let's just say they're not there anymore. Uh, this machine actually came all the way from Estonia uh, from a friend of mine called Ergo. Thank you, Ergo. Uh, it was free. I just, well, I sent him some uh, fiber channel uh, drives for his... Uh, for a Sun uh, 280R and yeah he gave me this thing so yeah let's look at the back ports so over here we have Kensington lock uh, surprisingly enough it's not that Apple proprietary lock thingy that they had going on around this time uh, we have the power input IEC of course uh, I think it is universal so you can you know, use it in any region of the world. We have our TV uh, input card, our video input card, rather. Let's zoom in on that a bit. So we have stereo audio, we have composite video input, and we have uh, S video input. This is the seven pin, the seven pin variant of the S video connector. I am not sure, but I think it does RGB. Don't quote me on it though, I am not sure, but it may do RGB. Uh, then we have ADB, Apple Desktop Bus, for keyboard and mouse and all that. So they daisy chain, so if you're not used to Macintoshes, the older ones had uh, two ADB ports, modern ones, well, quote unquote modern ones, only had one because the keyboard hard had the um, connector for the mouse. Uh, then we have uh, to uh, serial ports, which are not geo ports, that means they do not have hardware handshaking. Which means, if you're using an external modem, yeah, you're gonna get crap throughput, like absolute trash throughput. Uh, your internet is gonna be really slow. Uh, so yeah, this one's for the printer, this one's for the modem. Note, uh, this machine is so crappy that uh, the serial ports, when you insert a an Ethernet card in the machine, you lose uh, the modem port. No, sorry, the printer port. When you insert uh, in an Ethernet card in the machine, you lose the printer port. When you insert an internal modem, you lose the modem port. Great Apple engineering right there. Uh, then we have our TV tuner expansion right there. Very nice. Uh, of course, these days it's 
absolutely useless because it is analog and so you have to use a a digital converter box and hook it up to either the composite uh, video inputs or use an RF modulator and old VCR or something like that to feed it to the analog I mean you can still watch TV if you really want to uh, then we have SCSI I do believe that is just SCSI 2 uh, narrow I think it is narrow not sure um, then we have a microphone input uh, which I do believe is amplified because it supports the uh, Apple plain talk microphone we have a line output uh, which is variable level in software nice we have an expansion uh, cover for the PDS slot I do believe it is for the PDS uh, then we have another cover this one is for the PDS too. I think there's two types of. Oh, right, right, right. This case is actually um, actually fit uh, a ton of computers, a ton of different computers. So this has an LC PDS slot, which has cards that connect directly into the slot and uh, feed out the ports through here. This this case I believe was used in the Quadra 610 I think it is the Quadra 610 I'm not sure it's a different machine uh, that came before it not sure which one it is that has actually a racer card that comes out of the PDS slot which is a different PDS uh, slot and then the card comes up to here and what you have to do so in the in that PDS slot you can fit a coprocessor card so either an FPU or a processor upgrade and then over here they would usually come with a DOS uh, compatibility card which was a a whole PC, whole x86 compatible PC uh, in a card and you would have to get a cable that went from the monitor output to the card to the monitor again and then it would have another branch which came out as the um, the controller port for MS-DOS games and all that uh, then let's move along we have monitor connector this is the Apple uh, DB15 connector for monitors Macintosh monitors uh, then we have a power button right here in the back and we have here the uh, COM slot uh, hole so uh, if you put the com slot is the communications slot this one is the first iteration of the com slot uh, which is based on an 030 bus I think and then it has some other lines for uh, serial and stuff so yeah uh, now let's, uh, let's take the motherboard out shall we Okay, so to remove the, the motherboard in this machine, you have to uh, pull down on these tabs right here, and then this plastic thing comes out. This comes off. Uh, I'm gonna remove this part of the power supply thing too. Uh, it's not supposed to come off, but as you saw, it's loose. Uh, so let's. Upgrading this machine is actually. Uh, way easier than you would expect a Macintosh uh, to be but so you remove these screws right here to remove the motherboard this one right here and this one right here sorry I have to avoid the tripod and stuff they're not captive which is weird for an Apple machine of this time period but uh, then you pull down this little handle right here like so and you pull on it being a bit careful because there are RF uh, protective tabs down there and there you go that's the motherboard out of the machine with everything on it uh, we'll take a closer look now and as you can see it just has an edge connector right there which is very nice edge connector just to 
transfer all the signals over. <coughs> so yeah, that that's it for the motherboard, really. Uh, the tuner card there really isn't that anything that interesting in it. Um, it's it's just a tuner module, like it's exactly the same you would find in a TV for from the time. Uh, it simply feeds, I think, either composite or RGB uh, to the motherboard internally, and then the uh, video capture card just handles everything. And really, I think that's all there is to see uh, in the case of the machine. Well, let's turn it around, actually. Right there. And let's see... If we can, if I do have uh, the appropriate tools right here to open this. So, to open the front of the machine, what you have to do is you have to jam a screwdriver. I am not making this up. You have to jam a screwdriver down here. You have to push a tub up like so. And another one. Again, under the PowerPC logo. Being gentle with these because uh, the plastics on these machines become very, very brittle over time, uh, especially on these, uh, uh, you know, 300 and 200 uh, series uh, Macintoshes. So then this just comes off like that, and then you have your CD-ROM drive over here, which is very hard to remove and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to remove it like this uh, yeah it's uh... it's quite a pickle to remove oh actually, yeah I know why it isn't being removed uh, so where did I leave my Where did I leave my uh, Phillips bit? There it is. Uh, so, you have to remove screw down here. I don't know if you're seeing that. You are. You have to remove this screw down here, and that grants you access to the. Uh, to remove this cover, which gives you access to the um, floppy drive the hard drive and the CD-ROM drive and they come out like this so the CD-ROM drive you pull up on this like so and there you go it is an Apple CD 600i and the camera there won't focus there we go sorta 600i, Apple computer, all that stuff. Has an edge connector right there. Uh, it's just scuzzy, like this just fits there. Not gonna remove it because these things again are brittle. Audio connector is also adapted to this edge thingy. And yeah, then it comes in a sled right there that just slides inside the machine, like so. The floppy drive just comes up like that and you pull it out and that's the floppy drive and then the hard drive uh, has a little tray which has broken uh, but it's loose enough now you'll notice uh, as compared to other uh, machines from Apple uh, this time uh, as opposed to them uh, it has an IDE drive now this is not the original drive. The original drive is extremely slow and it's one gigabyte only. Uh, 1.2 gigabytes. Sorry, this drive right here is a, I believe a Fujitsu I put in it. I don't exactly remember which drive I put in it, but it is a, yep, it is a Fujitsu. It is a 10 gigabyte drive. And without, uh, well, sorry, using, uh, sorry, without uh, the uh, modified version, sorry, of the um, Apple 
uh, disk format utility uh, you cannot use third party drives so yeah I had to use a patched version of that of disk tools I think it's called this one comes in a slide too and it had a pull tab right there which has been removed So yeah, it's as you can see the machine itself is really easy to upgrade and to service. It's it's really weird uh, to see an Apple uh, computer so easy to you know being so easy to service and to maintain and all that. This was a breeze. Uh, now you can take the system apart. So this cover has a screw on the back and it just slides back and then the sides just come off. And then you have a metal plate under here, and there's power supply right there, and that's it. The rest is just ribbon cables connecting everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you will you'll only have to take it that far apart, like once every 20 years, just to clean it a bit, and that's it. Oh, I forgot to mention, it has a cooling fan right here, so it is not passive. Uh, yeah, the power supply gets hot enough uh, to burn itself to death. That is one issue on these machines. Um, I found out that the power supply has one resistor, one power resistor, uh, which I think is part of the standby circuitry for the soft power, um, which gets really, really, really hot, and it is next to a capacitor which is smoothing out the output of a voltage regulator which also happens to be beside the capacitor so what happens is the resistor gets hot it completely destroys the capacitor uh, the capacitor uh, stops uh, smoothing the uh, power output from the regulator the regulator starts getting hotter and hotter as the regulation as, as the voltage regulation becomes harder and harder to achieve and the hotter the, regula the regulator gets <laughs> the more it heats up the capacitor and it's just a vicious cycle of the capacitor gets even more and more and more destroyed and yeah I, I have to find a way to fix that uh, I'll have to replace the capacitor, I haven't replaced it yet uh, but I will so uh, I do believe you have to either smack the machine to get this cover. I think that's what you did originally. Uh, I think nowadays with the plastics, you know, not being as uh, flexible and elastic as they used to be, uh, you have to push the tabs back in right there. And you'll hear lots of creaking and cracking sounds and all kinds of horrible stuff, but... Yeah, uh, I think this tab just broke. Yeah, I think it just did break. Yep. No, it didn't. Impressively enough. Um, taking these machines apart is really a lottery. Uh, sometimes they'll break, sometimes they'll come apart just fine. Uh, there you go. So that's that. Uh, let's move on to the uh, motherboard. So I'll move the camera and give you a little look on it. So let's uh, begin with the motherboard. Uh, I stopped for a bit there to study a bit uh, the impressively convoluted architecture of this machine because this is horrible. And now I'll I'll explain why it is one of the worst uh, Macs ever made. Uh, it is it is not because it is an, an unreliable machine, at least not this version. Uh, the first version uh, had a ROM which was kind of unstable because this thing uh, kind of does some again really convoluted stuff um, to get uh, stuff done, but. First of all, let's tear down the motherboard, or the whole, you know, computer complex here. Uh, so, this right here is the MPEG. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. This is the MPEG decoder card. 
which plugs into the LC PDS slot, which isn't really a PDS slot at all, but uh, yeah, let's unplug that. So we have this right here, Apple computer. Yeah, there must be something wrong with the focus on my camera. I do not think this can, can be that bad from the factory, but yeah. Uh, again, it has a Texas Instruments DSP right there. It has this C Cube uh, MPEG decoder. And then it has the LC PDS uh, connector right there. Then it has this connector right here, which I believe transfers uh, video over to the video capture card uh, via. Um, uh, component. I think the topology does seem to indicate that it does. So on the motherboard we have the COM slot, we have the PDS right there which is an LC PDS, a normal PDS is just this part right here. Then it has this extension which indicates it's an LC PDS. Uh, we have this ribbon cable which goes up to the uh, video capture board right there which I'm gonna remove. You need to remove a screw in the back panel to remove the video capture board. So you remove this screw right here. And that allows you to remove the... Ooh, I hate that sound. Uh, video capture card, which comes out of this slot like that and then li lifts like so and you have your typical you know Philips SAA uh, chip from the 90s uh, typical video capture board all the video capture boards pretty much from the 90s uh, used that chip uh, then we have again motherboard we have this is the L2 case and ROM slot why they combine both I have absolutely no clue, but there's the uh, cache side of things, and here is the ROM side. Now, thankfully, this is a revision B uh, ROM, which means uh, a lot of hardware bugs. Uh, I guess they're software because they're in ROM, but a lot of bugs were ironed out in this. Uh, then we have 272 pin uh, uh, SIM slots which can be populated independently. I don't think I'm gonna remove this because this chip is double sided and it hits the uh, CPU heatsink. So they can be populated independently. Now if you know uh, about uh, uh, 72 pin uh, SIM slots uh, you'll know that they're 32 bits uh, wide. Um, that's a problem because this, the PPC 603E CPU, is actually a well, it, it's a it's a 32-bit CPU, but uh, it has 64-bit data paths internally, and usually is coupled to a 64-bit uh, data bus. And yeah, that's part of this, of what makes this machine a little, let's say, challenged. Um, so, this, the CPU right here, right, is actually hooked up not to a 64-bit bus, not to a 32-bit bus, but to two different 32-bit um, buses. So there's 32-bit bus left and 32-bit bus right. So 30, yeah, like bear, bear with me. Uh, the 32-bit left bus handles the COM slot, PDS. It handles uh, audio, and I. I have to use my cheat sheet uh, here. I'm sorry with my pronunciation today. I don't know what's wrong with me, but my cheat sheet. Let's get that out, aka use my phone to look that up. 
Okay, so the 32, the left 32-bit handles networking, so that's the com slot, audio, that's this, uh, ADB, so keyboard and mouse input, and SCSI, so that's, well, the SCSI bus that comes out of this. Um, wow, that's pretty impressive. Uh, and, sorry, it is 8 bits wide. Wow. No, sorry, networking and audio, networking audio and ADB are 16 bits wide. And then, SCSI is 8 bits. So that's multiplexed by, I guess, these glue logic thingies. Right32 has a 32-bit memory controller. Now, that means this uh, CPU, which has a 64-bit data path, is hooked onto 32-bit memory. Now, if RISC is a load store architecture, which means the CPU uh, actually, you know, do, does operations on data that is stored in it. Uh, in the registers, right? So it has 64-bit uh, registers. That means that every time it has to do an operation in memory, what it has to do is... So you'd usually have a 64-bit uh, data bus to the memory, which means the CPU would just access the memory, copy the stuff from memory. What this CPU has to do is it has to get it has to use one clock cycle to get first 32 megs, uh, 32 bits, sorry, of the data it wants to access. Then it has to use another cycle to access the other 32 bits of data. And then it has to use another cycle to stitch them together. And then in the fourth cycle, then it can operate on, on, that, um, on that data. So you start seeing right there um, why this machine is starting uh, to become kind of a hack job. Um, uh, to just make matters worse, the CPU bus and all of the buses in the machine, really, uh, the memory bus especially, uh, so everything is, is derived from a single crystal, that is this one right here which in this machine should be a... what the heck? What? Okay then, I have no clue. Um, I do believe this is an oscillator and it's 45 megahertz. Maybe I, ha I had that uh, wrong, but the machine derives all of the clocks from this oscillator right here or the crystal or something. I know it derives them from a single crystal. Um, from a single oscillator. So, the CPU in this one, in this machine, runs at 120 megahertz. CPU bus and the memory bus run at 40 megahertz. Then these buses right here run at a different clock speed. I do believe the the PDS runs at 16 megahertz, I think. So the thing is, 40 megahertz, 32-bit uh, memory bus, that's not fast at all. That is actually very, very slow. Uh, so, yeah, that's to make matters worse. Then, um, let's get to my cheat sheet again. Uh, so now let's go on to the 32, uh, the right 32 uh, bus. I, I cannot believe you could even make a machine like this. Um, so, right 32 includes a memory controller, the 8-bit IDE hardware controller, so it's not just IDE, right? Um, it, it's 8 bits. It's an 8-bit IDE controller. Um, okay, video is also done uh, by the... No, video as in that video, as in monitor, is also done by Right32. And then the TV controller, <laughs> this video, so the capture card, is again done right from right 32. So that's something else. So like I mean, both uh, 
both buses converge on the CPU. That means there's no DMA from one bus to the other. So, if you want to, let's say, access the network while watching TV, uh, yeah, there's no DMA between the buses. So, sorry, you, have, you want to record something uh, from the TV and record it on a network uh, drive. The CPU has to transfer all the data, so it has to get it from the bus into the CPU, back out from the other bus, and then into the network. Yeah. Uh, so, the multiplexing, I, do, I am not sure about how the multiplexing on this machine works. Like, there's, apart from the 232-bit the buses, then a lot of more buses come out of those, right? And I have no clue how this all works, but I'm like I'm sorry for that, but it seems that when you are moving the mouse or you're typing on the keyboard, uh, the data that comes from there doesn't allow like data from the CPU to go to the sound hardware, so sound gets choppy if you type too fast. Um, hard drive, the hard drive is on the same bus, it's multiplexed on the same bus as the TV uh, controller and the capture card. So when you're capturing video, the hard drive cannot by any means keep up uh, with the video you're capturing. So it, no matter what the resolution you set, no matter what the compression settings are, uh, no matter if you have a an MPEG hardware decoder card, no matter the speed of your CPU, no matter the amount of RAM, you will never be able to record at a decent frame rate. So you can watch TV at here over here in Europe it's 50 uh, fields a second so 25 frames a second and in NTSC it'll be 30 or 29.997 or whatever it is. But uh, you will not be able <laughs> to record uh, TV at the actual frame rate uh, you're watching it at. Um, so my my battery just ran out, so uh, for me about uh, 15 minutes passed, but for you nothing passed. So yeah, um, that's the issue with this machine. You can do uh, things at like one thing at once, like you can access the network, or you can watch TV, or you can. Uh, watch videos, you can, I don't know, play a video game at once, but if you're accessing the network, for example, and you're trying to, like, say, play music from the network, it's not gonna work. Uh, you want to play a video from the network, not gonna work. Want to, I don't know, stream something to the network uh, that's not just a file, so, like, audio or something that comes from the CPU it's not gonna work, it's gonna be very slow uh, anything that requires real-time performance uh, apart from CD playing because that's done uh, by the uh, CD drive itself the CD decoding um, anything that, or I don't know, video, watching video uh, yeah, MPEG video can be done thanks to the hardware MPEG decoder, uh, but anything else that requires real-time uh, processing, even music uh, played by the system itself, not gonna work really, so the music stops if you type too fast on the machine. Uh, this even happens in video games, uh, even with MIDI, <laughs> if you are pressing the controls, too fast, and you're setting too, you're sending too many characters to the machine. Uh, the MIDI music will will hang. You'll have hanging notes and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, this machine, uh, it's I guess all right for using it as a CD player, or as a TV, or as a multimedia device in general. It's okay. It's an okay machine. 
if you want to record um, TV, forget, forget about it. Want to record video, forget about it completely. Um, you're, so if, if you looked at this machine and said, oh, it has composite, composite input, it's really going to come in handy uh, for, you know, digitizing my VHS tapes or, <clears throat> or my Hi8 tapes. Uh, you know, because it has this video, so you can do some, you could theoretically do some really good um, video uh, digitization of this on this machine. Nope, <laughs> not really. Uh, get yourself a different machine. Uh, I, uh, I thought this machine would replace my current uh, video digitizing machine, which is a Power Macintosh G3, which I've already shown. Um, which is a, uh, it's a beige Power Macintosh G3 which has been upgraded with a G4 CPU and it has tons of other upgrades uh, I thought this machine could replace it so I could free up a PCI slot in the G3 because it has a capture card in it not the case, um, not the case at all so yeah, this is a really slow machine uh, for anything computational on the internet I've heard, I haven't been able to connect it to the internet yet. Um, I'm meaning, I mean to uh, either set up a local talk network at home so I can bridge um, my Power Macintosh G3, I can bridge this guy, this uh, Performa 6320 CD, and I can bridge a PowerBook 160 that I'm waiting for. I bought it and I have to recap uh, the. And the battery is running out again. <laughs> I have to re recap the display. So, conclusion of this machine. Very, very slow. Uh, hopefully I'll make a different video, a separate video, uh, where I show um, capabilities of it. I'll show it booting up into macOS uh, 7.6, which is what I have installed in it. And I'll show you, well, the capabilities of the machine. And that's pretty much about it for this hardware tour. So, you know. Yeah. Bye.